<laughs> anyway, this is a very special show because it's from the new studio and because Representative Chris Lee is here and because Peter Rosick from Hawaiian Electric is also here. What a fantastic thing. We made it. We actually got on the air, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so uh, let's start with you, Peter Rosick. Uh, you had something. Hawaiian Electric has something today to tell us about. We do. Uh, what we hope, uh, what we believe will be some, some good news. We, have, we know that the bills, our customers' bills are very high. The reason is, is unfortunately very simple. The price of oil is very high, and we think it's going to stay that way. So we're, we're trying uh, everything we can do to bring that price down, the price of our of electric bills for our customers. And the one, the best long-term way we can do that is with, with renewable energy, which we can get at fixed prices and, and long-term contracts where there's a great deal of stability. And as oil prices go up, these contracts become more attractive. We, we're in a sort of a waiting period for a competitive bidding uh, uh, effort that the, uh, the Public Utilities Commission asked us to do, and it's been uh, taking us longer than we hoped. So what we've done is we're, we put out an invitation. We think there may be some um, renewable energy projects here on the island of Oahu that are substantially ready to go, that have been waiting until this whole competitive bidding process gets uh, gets organized. And competitive bidding is a very good thing because it helps you make it helps the Public Utilities Commission and the Consumer Advocate and everyone else uh, have the assurance that we're getting the best possible deal at the best possible price. But um, we think there are some projects that are, are ready to go, and and so we've said if uh, there are renewable energy projects that could be go online quickly by 2015 in, in the utility business that's lightning speed um, and they would have a low price 17 cents per kilowatt hour or less oh, gee, that's good. Uh, which would be a very good price and uh, five megawatts or larger so we're not talking about somebody's rooftop we're not talking about a uh, you know even a business rooftop we're talking about a substantial project uh, and that we will uh, if they'll come in, we'll take a look. We, they have to be ready to open their books and show us that the price is a good price and that they can deliver on it and so forth. And then we can go to the Public Utilities Commission and ask for a waiver, uh, substantially to say, okay, for this particular project, we don't have to wait for competitive bidding. Uh, you know, the, every bit of renewable energy that we can get online at a low price uh, reduces the overall bill for everybody. It gives us a greater amount of stability. So, um, and we've got a, it's a fairly short time frame. So we, we really mean people that are kind of ready to go. So this is, you know, I don't expect anybody listening to say, oh yeah, I've got that project. But I think it's important that we try to tell people, uh, you know, certainly they call us to talk to us about their bills, but we want to make it clear that we're trying um, you know, the things we can do to get some control of these bills because we know uh, it, it's, it's nerve-wracking for people trying to plan, it's hard for people to budget, uh, it's hard for people to pay their bills, and that's not good for any of us. That's great, Peter. I mean, I think this possibility will serve as an incentive to entrepreneurs to hustle and, and get the benefit of a fast track. Uh, I think it might even uh, get some local entrepreneurs, you know, to come and play. Um, and I think people will appreciate that Hawaiian Electric would like to reduce the rates if it possibly can. Absolutely. You know, the, the, we don't, on all the fuel we buy for our own generation and all the power we purchase from uh, independent power producers, whether they're conventional like AES or Kalailoa or whether they're uh, renewable like the wind farms or H Power, we don't make any profit on that. We don't have any markup on that. All we do is pass that through. But we do want to try, and the Public Utilities Commission and the Consumer Advocate insist that we get the best possible prices. Because a very large part, more than half of anybody's bill, is just to pay for that fuel, just to pay for that uh, purchase power. So uh, we can't control the oil costs. It's controlled in markets in Asia and, and a lot of other international factors. But uh, to the extent we can get locally based, clean, renewable energy onto the system, it's good for the environment, obviously. It's good for our energy security because we don't have to worry about that big tanker that has to arrive here every week or so. And it, it's good for the economy. Anything we can do to, to get more money in people's pockets is, is good for everybody. And frankly, the best thing that can happen for the utility is to, to be part of a vibrant economy. That's when you know we can do the most good, and, and so uh, we think you know it's a win-win situation. We think there may be projects out there. 
as you say, it may kind of break things up a little, you know, break things open a little bit if somebody does come in at a, a, a lower than usual price. Other people are going to have to say, oh, wait a minute, uh, you know, if that's if if that's the going rate, you know. So there's a lot of advantages in, in doing it this way. Mostly speed and trying to get a reduced yeah. amount. Speed, reduced, speed is everything. Yeah, yeah. and you know, it, it, the the the, the, the competitive bidding process, as I said, is a good process. It has its value. This one's taking a long time because it's complicated. Uh, but it does take a long time, and uh, going through that, and then going and get permissions, and then going and starting the construction, when there may be a faster way for some of these things. So that's that's the basic, that's the basic story, and we'll see. It's going to be it's a very short turnaround, so within about a month and a half, we'll know whether there are some um, projects that we can go to the PUC and say, give us a waiver. Let us just go talk to these people. They'll show us their books, we'll understand their pricing, and we'll understand uh, their business model, and, and we'll have that, that assurance that we're getting a good price. So that would be good. Thank you, Peter Rosick, Hawaiian Electric. Appreciate me, you coming down. Let me, can I, can I do a short brag on my company here? A short brag on the company. Okay. <laughs> We've just signed up uh, with a program called Hawaii Hires Heroes, which is easy for me to say, but it might be a little. Hawaii Hires Heroes. And basically, it is the employer's support of the Garden Reserve, uh, has a program uh, for veterans, uh, for people that have either been short term or, or long term active duty, and uh, they're coming back and, and, you know, coming out of, out of the, the wars we've been fighting or their service. And Hawaiian Electric, I'm proud to say, has one of the highest numbers of veterans, including me. I, I know I don't look like a uh, battle-hardened veteran, but I, me, <laughs> I spent three years in the service back in the day. And something like 200 or more of our employees are uh, veterans, and we are very committed to you know, hiring people. Uh, they come to us very often with very high work ethics, very high standards, good education often, and you know, sometimes in, in the fields you know, that we need or, or trainable. So, we signed on to be part of this. There are other companies here as well, but uh, we're, we're kind of proud of the fact that we're, we're one of the largest already and we're committed to being uh, a leader there. So thank you for letting me brag on that a bit. Sure. I know a couple of those, those officers who joined the Hawaiian Electric. They're some of the best. Thank you, I, Peter Rosick. Thank you, Hawaiian Electric. Thanks. We're going to take one more um, feature here, and that's uh, Hawaiian, uh, Hawaii Energy. Uh, that is your nano moment. Your megawatt moment <laughs> here at the beginning of the show, uh, and we have Larry on the line to tell us what's new in in the in the um, megawatt moment tonight. Larry, how are you, Jay? Good. So uh, what kind of savings can you have? What kind of uh, rebate can you get? Well, the rebate is $150, and folks can probably save up to about $200 a year in electricity costs. Mm -hmm. These full pumps typically are installed, and they, they run 24-7 sometimes. And what this technology does is it runs variably, so there's a controller to it. So when you get it installed, uh, it's programmed to run just as much as needed. Oh, this is the same thing as the per same idea as the parking lot fan mechanism you guys have have been uh, uh, suggesting, right? It's the same idea. Yeah, and I mean we we live in a world where where electricity was once cheap, and engineers and architects, uh, and for all kinds of planning people, assumed that it would stay cheap. So they installed all these things that run it 24 by 7, and now when it's not so cheap, those things are wasting electricity. So this is the same. So one of your, one of your uh, threads here is to find those wastes and cut them off using good technology. That's right. Reduce before you produce. 
I've heard that. What's the, what's the website address? Uh, HawaiiEnergy.com Or you can give us a call at 537-5577 here on Oahu or toll free D77 Okay, the idea is all you people out there who have swimming pools, want to save a little money and want to, want to get rich with Larry's incentive, you know, call them up. Let's bury the man in calls, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Appreciate you coming on the show. Take care. Aloha. Aloha. See you soon. Okay, and on to the main part of our show. In a moment, we're going to have Sharon Moriwaki here. She's going to join us for the second quarter with Chris Lee, Representative Chris Lee, the chair of the House Energy Committee, who you all want to meet. We'll be right back at the other side of this break. Thank you, Jack Waters. It's great to be on the air. It never felt so good. <laughs> what a great excitement. And we this had... new space, this studio is wonderful. <laughs> now that's the voice of Sharon Moriwaki. She's the co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, which is the progenitor of this show on Wednesday. This is Think Tech Energy Wednesday. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to do today with Sharon is, is have a kind of a welcome festival <laughs> for Representative Chris Lee. Well, thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> We're so pleased to have you on, Chris, our new chair of the Energy Committee in the House. Yeah. Doing a great job. Yeah. We're delighted. You know, we knew you before, but uh, somehow it's like old friends now. And we're sort of delighted that with your situation and your new position, and we sort of want to welcome you that way. Thanks a lot. Well, I, I, I caution you, we're only halfway through, so in case the bills all die before that happens, you know. <laughs> we'll have you back again to us. Yeah. <laughs> we're not going to change our minds. <laughs> anyway, so I, I'd like to, you know, I, I titled this show, although we didn't get a chance to say it yet, is How Energy Looks to Our New Chair of the Energy Committee in the House. Um, and I'd like to know, you know, your, your feeling these days. Be personal. Sure. No, How does it you feel know, to be chair? Well, well, let me put this in perspective by saying uh, when I was first elected four years ago, and actually when I came home from college three years before that, I was not as optimistic as I am today. Um, particularly coming back at a time straight out, getting your first job, trying mm -hmm. to afford the cost of living here, mm -hmm. paying for energy, which is a whole new thing. When I left here, I was a high school student. And, you know, my parents paid for energy, so <laughs> leave the light on, no problem. You know, run, run, leave the shower, all that stuff. And, and now, coming back, um, it shows up in your bill. And that's something that's been uh, tough to swallow. I think for a lot of folks my age, many of my friends. And um, what we've seen in the last few years has been really um, exciting, actually. And particularly this year, because Hawaii is at a place where we can go one of two ways. And there's going to be a big change no matter what. Um, Hawaiian Electric Company has some big changes coming. They've got to meet EPA requirements to, uh, to clean air standards and all of that. And they've got to change fuels or change their generation capacity. There's all kinds of stuff going on in the, the distributed generation renewable market with solar, vo mm -hmm. solar photovoltaic. Okay. Um, there's big wind projects on the neighbor islands. There's mm -hmm. potential for uh, connecting geothermal on the Big Island with Maui, with Oahu. Um, and all this stuff is coming to a head in these next couple of years. And so um, I think there's a lot of opportunity. And I'm excited to be here to try and help steer that just a little bit in the right direction. Inherent in what you say, I mean, it sounds like something that I've thought about. And that is we live in, in a historical transformation. You know, you're in a place, in a job, where you're going to change history, not only for the state, but maybe, maybe even for the world, because we're a laboratory. We're going to, we're going to give this gift elsewhere. Sure, sure. Yeah, no pressure, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but you're absolutely right. I mean, Hawaii, given that we have limited land, a growing population, limited resources, we're at a point where our existing grid, which is uh, you know a 20th century grid, is reaching its maximum potential, and we've got to adapt it to meet the renewable energy of the future, and all of this. Um, is what the rest of the world and the rest of the country is going to face in years to come. But they're not there yet. They've got more land. They've got more resources. They've got grids. They can connect to other places. We don't have that. Mm -hmm. So this is this is the first time we're going to put all this stuff to the test and see if we can come up with a solution that that transitions us to a 21st century, cheaper, cleaner, renewable future and do it right. Well, you've touched on a bunch of philosophical points, but I wonder if you want to take a minute and just give us your philosophy 
uh, to the extent you haven't already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think there's there's uh, a couple of big things at play. One, um, we live in Hawaii. Our environment, our, our, our ecosystem here is everything to the extent that we can protect and preserve that and be truly green and renewable, that's great. The second is, of course, we mentioned this already, the cost of living, keeping the prices associated with that energy and that transition in checks so that everybody can afford it. And hopefully, over the time, reduce those costs. And those are the two big things um, that are drivers uh, behind the things that I'd like to participate in, I think. Those two things, more than anything else. Well, um, you know, aside from the philosophical, I'd like to know, you know, because there, there might be a few people out there listening who someday aspire to be a legislator or on the, on the uh, you know, uh, the House uh, Energy Committee. There are some people out there who might aspire to get your job someday. <laughs> They're very young. It won't be for I, I think there's a lot of folks that, that, that are, they want it right now. <laughs> I'm almost at a point where I want to give it to them. <laughs> well, I, I like to know what it's like when you get up in the morning. I mean, what, what is it? What's the job entail on a day-to-day -day basis, either during the session or after the session? You know, it's a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. I've been uh, fortunate to have been elected. Uh, this is my third term now, but um, assuming this role, because it's incredibly technical work and there's a whole lot of yeah. background required. Um, most days I'm, I'm at the Capitol still till uh, midnight or wow. 1 a.m. Wow. If you've got a hearing, I mean, yeah. our, our, I should explain, you know, our process is so compressed. We've got from January through May yeah. to hear thousands of bills and um, figure out what we're going to do with all of those. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. And so when you're hearing eight or ten bills on a given day, which is uh, a small number, um, you've got to do all the background work. You've got to talk to the stakeholders. You've got to figure out what's happening. And that takes an enormous amount of time. So it's, it's a lot of work. I'm still waiting for my first weekend um, <laughs> it's since coming, January. It's, well, maybe, it's maybe around the corner. May or June. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it's worth it. I, I really want to emphasize it is worth it. I mean, for anybody who wants to get involved in the political process, no matter the issue or area yeah, of yeah. interest, uh, the, the chance to try and steer things the right way and, and the ability to connect people um, is is unmatched. Especially, you know, in energy, especially now. Absolutely. So uh, a couple of other thoughts about this. Um, you know, uh, we, we talked before the show began about listening to constituents and, and stakeholders and so forth. And I commented, I wonder if you would comment on my comment. Uh, is that you know, sometimes what they say is not what they mean. Oh, sure. And, and you've got to look beyond <laughs> the words. You've got to really, really, really listen and find out what's going on. What do you think about that? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, and I'm glad you asked, which is the standard answer when you really don't want to give an answer, <laughs> quite frankly. No, but, but it's, it's true. You know, politics um, is, is the art of deciding who gets what. And you're never going to be able to give everything to everybody. So it's triaging what's available, what resources are available, what bills are going to get passed, what issues are going to get addressed. And uh, you, you've got to, at the same time, uh, satisfy folks to the, to the extent that they're going to either reelect you uh, or at least not boot you out of office the very next day <laughs> uh, and show up, show up with pitchforks and torches. <laughs> and so it's, it truly, I think more than anything, is listening. It's giving people the chance to, yeah. to have their say. And if you can do that, I think you tend to satisfy about 85% of the concerns out there. Um, and so for us, particularly with energy, when we talk about what we want to do, everybody can say, mm -hmm. you know, I'm for renewable energy, I'm for more jobs, we're for better education and health care. But what does that mean? And, and that's where the rubber meets the road this mm -hmm. year. And that's where these issues are coming to a head because there's mm -hmm. difficult choices. You know, you talk about um, transitioning to renewable energy. Are you going to do it if there's a greater cost involved? Right now, uh, one particular issue, uh, which we were talking about just a minute ago, was um, uh, changing the barrel tax, which was created to uh, fund the transition to renewable energy, among other things. Uh, right now, there's a switch to liquid natural gas that could be potentially on the horizon. That wouldn't be captured by that. So do we incorporate uh, liquid natural gas into that tax and level the playing field between all fossil fuels? It'll potentially raise the cost of liquid natural gas a little bit, but it will also, on the other hand, help fund our transition to renewable energy on the state side. So how do you weigh that? That is difficult. At midnight. Yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, really, at a moment of clarity, 
when you have <laughs> the quiet of being able to think <laughs> and, put, and integrate it. That's what, you, know, you know, the thing, the problem is that people who come to you, whether they come in the privacy of your office, you know, when you talk to people who stop by, or in a hearing where they give testimony, um, they don't necessarily represent everyone. They represent stakeholders, they represent lobby groups, sure. uh, they represent nonprofits, uh, and they all have a certain bias, you know, a, a place from which they're coming. And the silent majority isn't really there because they're silent. You can't hear them. You have to figure out what the silent majority And they're important. Yeah. Know? So how do you integrate all that at midnight? So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's hard thing because when you talk about the silent majority, I mean, people got to realize these are the folks who don't have time to make it down because they're mm -hmm. working at jobs, multiple jobs, late into the night. They got kids. They, you know, there's a hundred other things that are uh, keeping them busy in their lives. But yet, the decisions we make are going to affect them and affect their energy costs and everything else. So, what it is ultimately is getting out into your district, getting away from the capital, getting away from the same uh, talking heads. Uh, and, and, and kind of reconnecting with the community because when you have someone, in fact I was at a community meeting just the other night in Waimanalo talking about energy and talking about mm. how the solar tax credit issue is going to come up and affect people and for a lot of folks it's over their head, you know, they, they've never considered this. But then you talk about one of the other initiatives we're working on which is making it uh, uh, on bill financing, on, on bill financing yeah. giving them the ability to uh, get away from the high upfront cost mm -hmm. and saying, well, you can just pay it down your electric bill. And you ask, well, who's going who's gonna to take advantage of that? And nearly mm -hmm. every hand in the room mm -hmm. goes up. And then you realize, and they realize, this stuff affects them. And that's what I come back to my desk with in the morning uh, was mm -hmm. the fresh perspective on, mm -hmm. okay, now we, I was for this before, now we really got to make this happen because it's evident that when people find out about it, they know exactly how it's going to affect them and it's going to be positive. Yeah, and, and that's so, and, and you know, you've got to keep people engaged. Absolutely. It's so easy, people go into apathy and they don't, they don't think it affects them, so they don't care, mm -hmm. and, you, and you lose the benefit of their thinking and uh, whatever their uh, bias and whatever their situation is, you need to know. Uh, anyway, I wanted to ask you another thing. Uh, you know, the, the relationship between the energy committees, if you will, House and Senate, was, you know, it was, it was pretty good, I thought, uh, with uh, Mike Gabbard in the Senate and Denny Kaufman, your predecessor in the House. Mm -hmm. But uh, it seems to be phenomenal now. Um, well, what's going on? Well, that's, <laughs> you know, this has been the difficulty with, and, and just with the legislative process in general. You got a House and a Senate, and they're going to disagree on things. And often, far too often, in my experience, the chairs have gone different directions. And the, the chair of one wants to do X, and the chair of the Senate wants to do Y. And only at the very end of the process, the 11th hour, they're forced to get together and compromise or negotiate or let the things die. And too many things go uh, unresolved until the last minute. And, who loses out because of that? It's the public because they don't have an idea of what's happening until the very end, until it's quite frankly too late to come in and, mm -hmm. and have their say mm -hmm. in the issue. And too many issues are decided this way. So what we decided to do this year, um, and I give a lot of credit to um, Chair Gabbard in the Senate, uh, because we've been working together and I think it's been a great relationship. We decided right up front, particularly with the contentious issues like the solar tax credit, we're going to decide these things early. We're going to iron out the, the kinks in the system. We're going to figure out where we're going. We're going to bring in the stakeholders and get everybody on board. Not everybody's going to be 100 percent happy, just like they wouldn't be at the end of the process, but we'll try and accommodate everybody and we'll make it absolutely transparent what we're trying to do and move ahead together in lockstep. And so far it's working out great. Yeah. Well. Sharon and I were there when you were when uh, 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 you were being uh, interviewed by uh, Hawaii News Now Terry yep. uh, Okita mm -hmm. what, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. in, yeah. in the, I guess that was in the, the Senate. This is the yeah. first time that we've seen something like this. It could be yeah. a real model for real yeah. leadership. I hope so. Yeah, talk about leadership. You know, uh, Energy Policy Forum is very interested in leadership, and uh, one of the reasons that we care a lot about uh, leadership in the energy world is because it's very complex and it's easy to get confused and therefore leadership becomes that much more important. It's, a, it's an inverse relationship, you know. So uh, after we come back from this break, I'd like to ask you your perception of how the landscape looks and how leadership works in the energy, in the energy sphere in our state. Okay? We'll be right back.
Thank you, Jack Waters. We're back. This is Think Tech Wednesday. I'm here with Sharon Moriwaki, co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, the progenitor of this show, <laughs> if you don't mind me saying that. I'm representative <laughs> Chris Lee, the chair of the Hawaii of the uh, Hawaii State Legislature uh, Energy Committee. So we're delighted to have you on the show. Chris. Glad to be back. So as we left it before the break, I was real curious about your thoughts about the landscape. You know, I mean, there have been various comments, starting with Neil Abercrombie's uh, concern what, a couple of years ago about forming an energy authority, and everybody says, oh, this is so complicated, it has so many players, it's not just the legislature, and you know, you guys should show leadership, and I think you are. Uh, but it's also the PUC, everybody's got to participate, take a piece mm. of the pie, the, say the leadership burden, if you will, the consumer advocate, uh, DBED, uh, did I miss anybody? Uh, and of I course the Hawaii Energy consumer Policy protect Forum. Cons uh, consumer advocate. Consumer advocate. Um, and the colonies. And the counties, right? Yes, Every absolutely. county. So a lot of players. So how, how does this work? Any thoughts about that? Yeah, there's a lot of talk back and forth, and I think that's... Uh, <laughs> but once you cut through that, I think, um, in particular this year, I mean, people are up against a wall in a lot of ways. And I think a lot of these issues are, are time-dependent, where they have you know a year or two left to figure them out, and so folks are finally coming together who didn't talk before, and that's been really positive. Mm -hmm. And so I think it, just by virtue of the fact that now they're forced to work together, they're going to. Um, we've had a, a number of bills, the legislature moving forward, uh, in particular, that these folks have been coming in on to work together. And, and it, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to go through just a couple of them. Before you go, just just one one further thought on that. You know, the thing is, we live in a democracy. Sometimes that's a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> but Other if, if Lee Kuan Yew were here, you know, Mr. Singapore, um, or a guy like Robert Moses, who built the infrastructure in New York City back in the 30s and 40s. Um, then it could get done very fast. Are you nominating me as dictator? For the, <laughs> <laughs> I, the thought has occurred to me. <laughs> I may just accept. <laughs> well, I, you know, there's a plate to step up to. It's a true fact. And, uh, I, and I think there's a, in a sense, there's a vacuum because there are so many players. And what, the way we're going to get through with this whole process, you know, get through the transformation, is by everybody sort of focusing on that and taking a piece of that plate. And I think you are. Mm -hmm. That's my comment. Well, well thank you. Um, you know, I, I was giving a talk to the uh, Women in Renewable Energy uh, group. It's, there's mm -hmm. about 70 or 80 women, which is intimidating in and of itself, being a guy talking in front of them. But um, what came out of the conversation at the very end was what's happening next and who's going to be leading the way. And mm -hmm. the one thing that I, I did want to say is, you know, we've seen more and more emphasis on energy from mm -hmm. everybody. The governor in the state of the state this past uh, January spent about five minutes talking about energy issues. And if we can mm -hmm. keep that dialogue up in the broader public uh, uh, sphere, I mean, that is going to be a win no matter who's involved and who's sitting at the table because it is the one thing that's going to get more attention and we'll have to get a resolution from the political perspective. And it should. Yeah. Absolutely. It should get more attention. It's the most important thing, you know, in terms of the economy, in terms of everything that happens. A, a, you know, a state that's paying too much for electricity or doesn't have enough electricity is a state with a bad economy. Mm -hmm. A state that has better electricity and, and at, at, with a, at a reasonable price is a better economy. It's just rack and pinion. It's the way it works. Oh, sure. I mean, you talk about putting money back mm -hmm. in people's pockets, which is the basic economic driver of any mm -hmm. uh, uh, sound economy. You're talking about hundreds of dollars that people are forking out right now for electric costs. If you can just reduce that by even 10, 20, 30 percent, that's a huge amount of money. Uh, that's injected mm -hmm. right back into our economy. And further, if we can get down from our uh, eight or nine billion dollar export to import a lot of this energy, we can keep that money circulating and artificially almost double the size of our tourist economy here locally. Yeah, which, you can imagine. I mean, oh, yeah. Take, take, uh, say, take eight billion dollars and say yeah. one, one, uh, what, one million people in the state. That's, I get this right, that's uh, something like uh, $40,000 per capita or something like that. Mm. It's, so it's many tens million. of thousands. And so it means my wife could go to Ala Moana and save their head <laughs> and feed the economy. She alone could make a great economy and, if this happens. And we'll be happy to collect those taxes. <laughs> right, right, right. More taxes. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about bills. There's lots of bills. We, we need to get to that. Absolutely. What do you got? So there's a, a few things I wanted to highlight this year, and there's a lot of moving parts. And one of the challenges, uh, especially coming on as uh, chair of the committee for the first time, um, is everybody wants to have 
uh, their mm. seat at the table and have their bill heard. And the one thing that I want to do is be open. And because I am, I'm, I'm not, I put this right out there, you know, I'm not the most technically well versed in this than, than anybody um, else who's been in the industry for a really long time. And so I wanted to give everyone their shot and mm. have these discussions about really complex, complicated issues. One of the favorite ones was, you know, what do you do when your neighbor builds a, a really tall house mm. and it now it's your, your PV system in your garage is in the shade 24 hours a day. You know, <laughs> yeah, I, and there's a bill a for problem. that. Uh, yeah. Is that right? There's actually a bill. It, it, but anyway, that, that, I don't think that's going to go anywhere. That's a discussion that needs to continue. But <laughs> but there are a few. People are really thinking now. <laughs> yes. <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> thinking about their neighbors and how well they get along with them. Is what they're thinking. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a couple bills in particular. One of them is um, uh, state financial um, uh, assistance, special purpose revenue bonds for a seawater air conditioning oh, project in Waikiki, yes, yes. um, which is moving along. Uh, it's it's uh, separate from the Honolulu one, but it's got a lot mm. of potential. And so we're hoping that moves forward. It's a different company. Different, different, different company, different group of folks, mm. but same concept. And, and Waikiki got just as much potential mm -hmm. with all those high rises sure. and everything else. Mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. and they're talking about going all the way up to uh, up the canal to um, University of Hawaii. Oh, uh, and potentially all in the water. Perfect. Use the canals. Yeah. yeah. Use the canals. Yeah. Great idea. So there's that. Um, uh, we also, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk over the years about the barrel tax. Um, a couple of years ago when the state was in dire financial straits, uh, a lot of that money that was supposed to be put into renewable energy uh, and agricultural uh, food security and all of that got diverted into the general fund to balance the budget, which is quite unfortunate. So what we want to do this year is return it to its original purpose and make sure that the state energy office gets the support it needs and um, uh, agricultural uh, food security gets gets the funding for, to do all its good stuff and mm -hmm. some of that may be biofuels which 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 dovetails right into the energy side as well so that's one bill that's moving right along this year mm -hmm. um, there's a, been a lot of controversy in a lot of the mm -hmm. neighbor island energy projects the big ones the the big wind on Lanai and Molokai uh, geothermal mm -hmm. on the big island there's a couple of bills moving that uh, talk about some of those things. One uh, which we passed out of our committee was a wind facilities decommissioning bill. And so what it does is require that if you're going to build a huge amount of uh, wind power, especially you know, if these things are you know, hundreds of feet high, you've got to be able to show that you can provide the financing to take them down if the project fails and the community is not just going to mm. be left with oh, these monoliths deal. doing nothing. Um, and that's not going to mm. resolve a lot of the concern over there, but it's going to give people peace of mind that should something like this be proposed for their community, if they're okay with it, they can rest assured that this isn't going to be uh, something that's going to going to um, hamper them yeah, should the project otherwise fail. It would, it would, they would oppose it simply for that reason. Yeah. This way it gives them some comfort. Absolutely. Absolutely. There, there was a project at South Point, as I recall, where the developer abandoned it and left these structures. You know? mm -hmm. To me, they're beautiful when they're working. Oh, sure. But when they're abandoned <laughs> and they're rotting in the field, yeah. it's not so beautiful anymore. Yeah. You know? and, you know, there's liability. I think right now in uh, England, they're concerned with things that have fallen over and sure. oh whatnot. They're so. huge, too. Yeah, so. yeah. And yeah. you know, wind can be fantastic. I think First Wind in particular has done a great job of engaging the community so mm -hmm. that everybody's on board with their projects and they do it right. Mm -hmm. um, but this makes sure that if, if, they, if projects can be done on state land where you don't have private mm -hmm. uh, right. public uh, power too. purchase agreements, that there's, there's assurance there. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, getting in, I mentioned um, um, biofuels earlier. You know, this is one of the things that I think mm -hmm. a lot of people tend to overlook because when you talk about the Clean Energy Initiative and being 70% renewable by 2030, that still means that it's a huge portion of our energy use, which is still fossil fuel powered. And we can't get away from that because we got to put uh, jet fuel in planes, we got to we got to put gas in cars and, and everything else. And this could be one of those areas that potentially could help replace some of the high oil costs with cheaper uh, local, locally grown biofuels, which creates local jobs and everything. So we want to explore that a little bit. Um, one of the bills that was moving along was to help uh, provide some assistance and funding for a zero waste biofuels uh, project. So it's mm -hmm. taking away um, used um, uh, uh, feedstock uh, that's here locally that otherwise mm -hmm. would go to waste and putting it into creating biofuels. And so there's potential there. Whether or not these things come out the other end, at the end of the day, who knows? But um, we're willing to entertain the discussion, I think, and, and we ought to evaluate everything. Well, a couple of thoughts. I mean, yes, I, I mean, I certainly agree with that. We have to evaluate everything, but um, we can't spend all our time on, on PV. 
know, <laughs> so many, if you ask the average guy what's cooking at Lechley, it's oh, with all these PV bills and, you know, the PV, mm -hmm. the sure. PV issues. And so, in fact, you know, there are lots of other things in transportation, as Sharon and I talk about all the time. Transportation has not been attended to. Yep. We really have to fix that. We have to put some time and effort into it. I know you are. Anyway, that's the, that's the sound of Chris Lee. He's Representative uh, Chris Lee, and he's the chair of the uh, House Energy Committee, the new chair. And our show is entitled How, uh, uh, How Energy Looks to the chair of the, the, new, uh, the new chair of the uh, House Energy Committee. And I'm here with Sharon Moriwaki, who is the co-chair. Everybody's a chair these days. <laughs> I'm the co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. This is Think Tech Wednesday. That's energy for you. We'll be right back after this break. We're back. We're live. May I repeat that? We're live. <laughs> <laughs> We're Think Tech on Energy Wednesday here with Representative Chris Lee, the chair of the uh, the House Energy Committee, and Sharon Moriwaki, the co-chair of the Energy <laughs> Policy Forum, which is always interested in what the chair of the House Energy Committee very, is doing. Very interested. <laughs> very interested. <laughs> Anyway, let's let's continue our discussion of the bills, Chris. Uh, we would like to know all the ones that are of consequence and all the ones that could be a surprise. Sure. Well, there, there are two big ones um, that are moving along right now. The first is the solar tax credits bill. You know, this is an issue that's been around for the last year or more. Um, there's been a huge number of folks putting PV on their houses. The state's got a credit for it. And because everybody's taking the credit, costs to the state's going up. So the question is, how do we continue to incentivize photovoltaic and other renewables for folks to allow them to continue to lower their energy prices at the same time make sure the state's going to be able to balance its budget. And this has been um, uh, an ongoing battle in the media and uh, at the legislature the last couple months here. But I think working together with uh, my counterpart chair Mike Gabbard in the Senate, we're pretty close to a compromise bill and mm -hmm. I think we've engaged the different stakeholders in the industry and we've got everybody for the most part um, on board. Uh, I think What's going to happen generally is that the tax credit's still going to be there. Folks can still rely on um, uh, assistance from the state to get uh, their photovoltaic systems. And on the industry side, what, what they want is certainty. You know, part of the problem is that the rules have changed mm -hmm. uh, from month to month, in fact, in some cases. And folks don't know how to sell these systems and they don't know how to approach right. people to yeah. say, you're going to it's going to cost you this much, but you're going to get X back. We can't tell you what X is. Yeah. And so folks can't plan. And so. We're going to um, ramp down, uh, the current plan is to slowly ramp yeah. down the credit over the next six years. Um, so folks will continue to be able to get a credit today um, and it'll slowly uh, get smaller and smaller um, as, as photovoltaic is cheaper and cheaper over time. Down to 15%? Down, right now, it's uh, down to about 15% the, the, uh, credit. The tail, the, the, that's the lowest yeah. Right, right. That's, the that's the tail end. And at that point, um, uh, there will be a study done by uh, the state, and they'll look at how effective the credit is, um, how much it's costing the state, but more importantly, what kind of impact it's having on consumers and what kind mm -hmm. of return it's getting from the, uh, in the economy. Because right now, solar construction um, uh, permits are 26 percent of all construction permits issued. I mean, solar photovoltaic is a huge portion of our economy right now that's returning uh, over $2 uh, to the state for every dollar invested. It's, it's considered by many to be a win-win. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, we're going to let it keep giving for a little while more here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. I saw an article, an ad in the paper by uh, Synetric, Alex Tiller, the CEO there, a couple of days ago, and uh, they said, we know that the credits may change this year, but we are going to we're going to offer you the job as if the credits stayed in place. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, this is all part of predictability. Right. Mm -hmm. Being able to tell a customer that it's going to be what it's going to be, yeah. and not mm -hmm. having surprises because mm -hmm. the customer gets nervous and people don't want to do this deal. And I don't think it's so much that they're going to get a, a sweet deal out of it but they're going to get some kind of deal. Any deal is okay for most people. I would think so, yes. <laughs> but we want to make sure it's enough that folks actually take this plunge mm. and they actually get away from their reliance on imported fuels and that they can start to produce energy on their own and start to save money. That's mm -hmm. the big thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, when what you, else? When you talk to people and they say they see their bill after they have the, their solar photovoltaic and they look at my bill, you know, and oh, they, yeah. they become the best... <laughs> The best recruiter. Best advertisement yeah, of all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, right. Yeah. You know, it's funny. If you, if you look at, and I've been meaning to get uh, actual data on this, but I'd be willing to bet that when you look at a neighborhood and the first PV house that goes in, um, and then you look yeah, and you see all of a sudden, out. very quickly, there's a number of other houses immediately around it. Because yeah. the neighbors are looking at that saying, I want that. Yeah, right. 
<laughs> but this brings up uh, the other really big thing which is happening at the legislature this year, which is connected to this and complements this. And this is mm. green infrastructure financing. It sounds really obtuse, but really what it is, is the state's next big step forward to make renewable energy available to the masses. You're talking about renters, which have never been able to capitalize on this mm. before. Uh, middle to low income folks who couldn't afford the upfront cost of renewable energy and photovoltaic. So. What the PUC is looking at right now is an on-bill financing program that's mm -hmm. going to let people, uh, that's going to give people the upfront cost and take care of that for installing mm -hmm. solar, for example. And these people will then pay down that cost over a number of years in their electric bill. Their electric bills will drop immediately, mm -hmm. and at the end of that payoff period, um, they'll own the thing and they won't have to pay anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, what the financing bill does is create a mechanism to provide the capital to do this and it's really exciting. We've had some uh, fantastic renewable energy experts from the mainland come in who are experts in this field who say there is upward, there are billion, literally billions of dollars in investment capital mm -hmm. that could come into Hawaii because the system that we're setting up right now coupling on-bill financing with this particular financing mechanism is has never been done mm -hmm. and these folks are going to dump money into the state to be able to make this happen. Oh, and exciting. we're going to win. We're all going to win. It's great. Yep. It's great. great. What I like most about it, though, is that, that, that the average Joe who doesn't yep. own his home yep. will have benefits also. Mm -hmm. That, that, make, that mm -hmm. makes me feel good, actually. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So it's, been, it's been kicked around for a couple, three years mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. It was we went for a study here and a study there, but now it sounds like it's really going to happen. It looks like it. And actually, we, we had um, the director down there and, and the chair of the PUC, and you're talking time frames, and are looking at a couple of years from now, 2015, you can start to have potentially the very first um, uh, folks start to enroll in this program. And they'll be open to uh, you know, the masses. So yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that means something politically, I think. Oh, absolutely. Because it means that Everybody, you know, there's a lot of people out there who says, who say, uh, you know, I'm not going to have a piece of this this benefit, so I don't care. Right. Right. Apathy, right. Uh, and, and resistant apathy even. It's only for the rich. It's only for the young. rich. That's right. You know, yeah. I'm just going to walk around have put. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is for everybody, and what that means yeah. is, well, it means we're doing our job yeah. because we're right. taking care of not just one mm -hmm. sector but everybody. Yeah, yeah. that's a great thing. A great leadership. Thing. Yeah. We got back to leadership. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's many more there than. Yeah, that's many folks have come before me. Bringing people to the table, though. Bringing people to the table. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, we have a few minutes more. What else we got? Well, there are a couple of things I want to talk about which which haven't uh, advanced this year, and these are. Uh, important, just as important, if not more important issues. You know, we've got a clean energy initiative which, which lays a, a vision out there for being 70% renewable by 2030. But what happens after that? That's the next question mm -hmm. because when you talk about leadership and you talk about continuity of leadership, you change energy chairs, you change the folks who are, who are uh, mm -hmm. leading the state, and what happens to all the planning? And so oh, what we want to do is reassess mm -hmm. the clean energy initiative and make sure that uh, as these huge changes take place over the next few years, there's going to be continuity down the road for the next couple of decades to come. So we're looking at our, our renewable portfolio standards, we're looking at net energy metering, and all the mechanisms that allow us to move forward with photovoltaic and clean energy and all this other stuff, mm -hmm. and, and we're reassessing right now. And what this bill, uh, one particular bill would have done is task the PUC with doing the appropriate studies to evaluate a lot of the new concepts that are coming out. Group. Um, Net energy metering, for example, if, if your whole neighborhood uh, wants to get together and it has photovoltaic, um, but others do not, you can get together and 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 uh, spread the cost around, but also the benefits. Uh, that's how you can also get renters and other folks who may not have a roof that can support photovoltaic um, benefiting from programs like this. Inherent in this spate of bills is the, is it this thing about how when the utility um, buys electricity from the uh, homeowner on net metering, I guess, um, it pays wholesale, but when it sells, it sells retail. Right. And, and the reason is it's entitled to a spread. It is the, it, it owns the wires, you know. Uh, is, is that, is part of this, these bills you're just talking about? Right, in fact, we just had a bill up, uh, I think yesterday, the day before, that and we had a great discussion about this, you know, how much does the utility get for providing the transmission capability, mm -hmm. yeah. what's fair? And so one of the things the PUC is doing this year is actually mm -hmm. a study to evaluate this very question. And if there needs to be a change in the law, they'll come back next year with recommendations. Mm -hmm. And we'll know exactly what we're talking about mm -hmm. with real live numbers. We're really drilling down on energy, you know? Because we were in dealing in gross terms back in 2008. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of 
enthusiasm, but we didn't have a lot of detail and we didn't have a lot of sophistication mm -hmm. about it. Now, as Robbie Am says, we're in chapter two mm -hmm. and yeah. <laughs> we have to drill down. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and you're here absolutely. for that. Perfect well, timing. That's good. Here to help. Here to help. <laughs> <laughs> what else we got? Uh, there's one other big thing, actually. You know, a number of years ago, in 2007, I think, the legislature said anybody who lives in an association or a condo uh, townhouse set up, um, they're able to put solar on and the association cannot prohibit them. The association has to come up with rules to let right. them do it, and a lot of them haven't. It's been you know, six, seven years now. So this bill would um, make sure that they follow through with that and allow everyone who's eager to get solar photovoltaic and, and hot water heaters and everything else um, able to do that in their, in their respective associations. It's just, it's just uh, I want to say, uh, Senate Bill 19, um, People follow me around, ring my phone like that. Yeah, I like the, I like the ringtone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can share it. But in the meantime, I'm going to share this music here on uh, KGU. I'm going to have a little break. We'll be right back after the music stops. Okay. That's Chris Lee, Representative Chris Lee, the chair of the House Energy Committee. And the, and the sound of the lovely lady is Sharon Moriwaki, <laughs> the co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. Wow, together in the same room. Fabulous.